Thank you all so much for being here. It's so nice to see so many students and faculty and people from the community. Um, my name is Anna Garvey, and I'm the president of the College Republicans at the University of Rochester. I don't think I've ever said that out loud to this many people in one room for <laughs> obvious reasons on a college campus these days. This uh, event has been a work in progress for this whole semester, so I'm really thrilled to see so many of you here um, ready to listen and learn and ask some questions. There is little doubt that the freedom of speech has been threatened on college campuses recently across America, but I'm going to leave most of that discussion to the person that you came here to see, Ben Shapiro. I could really run out of breath going through his resume, so I'll just run through some quick highlights. Ben is a graduate of UCLA and Harvard Law School, where he graduated cum laude in 2007. At the age of 17, Ben became the youngest syndicated columnist in the United States. Since then, he's been relatively busy, as you might know, writing national bestsellers such as Brainwashed, How Universities Indoctrinate America's Youth, might sound familiar to some of you, and Project President, Bad Hair and Botox on the Road to the White House. He is now the Editor-in-Chief for The Daily Wire, and you may also know him from his talk show, The Ben Shapiro Show, or his many appearances on radio and television shows where he's been an ardent and articulate defender of conservatism. We are so honored and excited to have him here at the University of Rochester. Before I turn the microphone over, I also just want to thank everyone at College Republicans, Students for Liberty, and the Campus Activities Board who helped put this together, as well as our wonderful advisors, Catherine Lewis and Glenn Sorosoletti from the Rochester Center of Community Leadership, as well as the America's Foundation, who is sponsoring this lecture series, the Fred R. Allen Lecture Series for this uh, past couple of weeks and the next few days to come. So without further ado, I would like to present Mr. Ben Shapiro. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thanks to Young America's Foundation for sponsoring this lecture. Thanks to Fred R. Allen for sponsoring it. Thanks to all of the groups from the various local colleges who got behind it to make this, this event such a success. And thanks to all of you for showing up, particularly if you disagree. And I hope that you stick around through the whole thing and don't walk out and don't try and shut down the event because that would be both fascist and silly. So if you stick around, we can have a good conversation and, and I hope to have a, a, a fun back and forth because I think that you know, these are perspectives that aren't too often told on college campuses. So today we're gonna to talk about all of these stupid nonsensical words that get thrown around on college campus and that are used to shut down debate, and are used to stifle discussion, and are used to label conservatives bad, evil, mean-spirited, terrible people who must be silenced lest their evil, terrible, horrible, hurtful words ruin lives and disable children. So, the left has been doing this sort of thing for literally generations. I mean, there's nothing particularly new here. Since the 1960s and 1970s, they've been occupying campus buildings. The only difference is that now, the people who occupy the campus buildings are your administration, right? They're the administrators. And the new left, their grandchildren, if they had kids, their grandchildren, those people are now trying to get them thrown out of jobs for, for no apparent reason because they're not sufficiently left for allowing people like me to speak. So today what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of these terms. And we're going to go through five particular terms that I'm sure you are all familiar with because obviously you're on campus. And we're going to talk about why they're stupid and why they're nonsense and why they're lies. Diversity, white privilege, Trigger warnings, microaggressions, and safe spaces. So we're going to hit the all-star list for the left. <laughs> now consider this your trigger warning if you are on the left. What I'm going to say will probably hurt your feelings, and I also don't care. <laughs> so let's just jump right in. Let's start with diversity. Diversity is the left's favorite thing. When they say diversity, however, what they don't mean typically is diversity of thought. This is not something in which they are particularly interested. A few weeks back, this is great because I actually get to speak at a lecture without a baying mob outside. A few weeks back, I spoke at Cal State University, Los Angeles, where there literally was a baying mob outside. And the reason for that is that a few days before I was scheduled to speak, the president of the university, in all of his might and wisdom, he said that the lecture had to be canceled in the name of diversity. And here is what he wrote. He issued this note to the entire campus and to the press. Quote, after careful consideration, I have decided that it will be best for our campus community if we reschedule Ben Shapiro's appearance for a later date so that we can arrange for him to appear as part of a group of speakers with differing viewpoints on diversity. 
Such an event will better represent our university's, university's dedication to the free exchange of ideas and the value of considering multiple viewpoints. Now, there was no date scheduled in the future because the date didn't exist. It was just a cancellation. So in other words, in order to ensure diversity of thought, the only person on campus who represented the right had to be shut out of campus. Right? That was diversity. Diversity means you shut up. Diversity means in the name of the feelings of a particular group on campus so that they feel special and they feel loved, you shut the hell up and you go away. And that's diversity of thought. And again, there's nothing new here. Since the 1960s, the left has been using, misusing the words tolerance and diversity to mean precisely the opposite of what they actually mean. When the left says tolerance, what they typically mean is tolerance of their opinion and no tolerance for yours. When the left says tolerance, what they mean is that they get to call the guys with guns to enforce their point of view. That's what tolerance is in the leftist idiom. And on campus, this has become, unfortunately, all too common. So the question is, what does the left actually mean by diversity? Because they don't mean diversity of thought, obviously. It's not something about which they deeply care. Diversity of thought is not supremely important to them. What they mean, of course, and we all know this, is racial diversity, right? This is what they mean, ethnic racial diversity. They mean that if you have uh, uh, the, the their, their goal is if you have the multi-ethnic mythical TV gang, then this is diversity. Right? You know, the one that you see on all the episodes of Law & Order where it's not like a black gang or a Hispanic gang or a white gang, it's one black guy, one white guy, a Hispanic guy, an American Indian guy, and a lesbian. Right? That's the gang, that, that, that's, the, that's the diversity that they're looking for. It doesn't matter if they're doing something good or something bad, the only thing that matters is that we're all doing it together and that we are all members of different racial groups. Now, here's the problem with, with racial diversity as a concept. It's completely irrelevant. Really, it's irrelevant. Because if you believe that values don't matter, but skin color does, you are by definition a racist. Right? If values don't matter, but skin color does, you are a racist, definitionally. Because all you care about is race. You don't care if the person is good. You don't care if the person is bad. You just care that they're black or white, which is being a racist. Right? It is reducing all of life down to the simplistic version of what level of melanin you have in your skin. Unfortunately, too much of the left, particularly on campus, is indeed racist. And they make themselves feel good by couching this racism in diversity, right? It's diversity. What underlies this reliance on diversity of race? Why is diversity of race, as opposed to actually just being a good human being, why is this so important to so many folks on the left? It's because when you boil leftism down to its only element, it really is only one element, leftism boiled down to one element is equality of outcome. Right? Fairness. Right? I want a fairer world. I want equality of outcome. And it's not equality of opportunity. It's not, as President Obama says, fair shot, fair shake, level playing field. No, what they mean, and President Obama means this too, is that if you have two people who are situated, it doesn't matter how they're situated, if you have two people in a room and one person is rich and the other person is poor, doesn't matter how the rich guy got rich, doesn't matter how the poor guy got poor, something deeply unfair has happened. Right? This is every tweet from Bernie Sanders. All of the tweets from Bernie Sanders are it's unbelievable that some people can go to college and other people's cannot. <laughs> and you say to yourself, well, but it sort of depends on why that's true, right? Well, like, I mean, what, what, one of the first things we learn as children is that life is not fair, that it turns out that some people go to college and some people can't. Sometimes that's for a good reason, sometimes it's not for a good reason. But in order to determine whether that is fair or not, you have to determine the why, right? How did it get this way? But for the left, the why is the problem. Because if you were to suggest, for example, that acting responsibly, behaving well, behaving decently, results in a better lifestyle, results in you being richer and more prosperous and happier, that's a violation of the left's views on equality and fairness. Because again, their view is, that's not gonna end with inequality of, inequality of outcome. By definition, it doesn't. If you have one person who's a criminal and one person who is not, there is no equality of outcome. The criminal is going to have a worse outcome, generally speaking, than the person who obeys the law. So if the left can't achieve this sort of fairness, then they have to tear down the system. They have to blame the system, right? The system itself has to be blamed for the lack of equality of outcome. We have to tear down the white privilege that surrounds us, right? If we go to racial group, as the left likes to do, and if we see, for example, that blacks on average are less than whites on average, then the idea is not that there are certain decisions being made by individuals inside the black community that result in less income and certain decisions being made by individuals in the white community that result in more income. No, what it is is some great systemic privilege, some institutional privilege. And we never name exactly what the institution is, and we never actually name the bad guys. It's just this sort of vague thing out there. Right? It's this monster that lives under your bed and is going to come bite you. 
Right? If you're black, there's this monster that's just out there in the sky and is going to come punish you for being black. Because you'll notice that very often when people talk about white privilege or institutional racism, they don't actually cite the example of where is the racism. Instead, they just say things like there are more black people in prison and must be due to institutional racism. Well, or it could be due to the fact that more people proportionally who are black are criminals. I mean, that's just the fact. And again, facts don't care about your feelings. But here's the thing. White privilege, it's a seductive idea. It makes us all feel really good. Because if you're unsuccessful, here, here's how it works. If you're unsuccessful and you're a member of a minority group, then you get to blame it on everything that surrounds you, which is a very comfortable position to be in. If you're a black guy and you're not doing well in class, then you can always blame it on institutional racism and white privilege. If you're a Hispanic person, you can do the same thing. If you're a woman, even though you're the majority of Americans now and the majority of people attending college, you can blame it on institutional sexism, right? on white privilege, on the patriarchy. For the only people who are basically left, you know, the people who are the great victimizers, the bad guys in all of this, the white heterosexual cisgender males, Right? The left will give you virtue. They'll, you're the bad guy, so you, know, you wear the black hat in this particular iteration of reality. But the left will grant you conditional virtue. The condition is that you admit that you're the bad guy. So if you say, I'm the bad guy, you're right, I benefit from white privilege, I benefit from institutional racism, then you're okay, then we know you're cool. That's how we know that you're in. Right? We know that you're awesome if you do that. You're cool, you're a good person, because you admit that your success is due not to your own efforts, not to the decision-making by you or your parents or the people who surround you. No, your success is due, again, to this vague thing that gave you your benefits and the other people who are less successful, those people, those people have been victimized by you in some way that you can't really even name. To the, to the left, the idea is that the Founding Fathers design, and this is the narrative of Howard Zinn and the rest of the historic left, is that the, is that the, the Founding Fathers were a bunch of white, privileged slaveholders who designed a system to benefit other white privileged slaveholders, and it infuses every part of American life. It's inescapable. As President Obama likes to say, it's written into our collective DNA, which for those people who still believe in biology means unchanging. You can't change people's DNA. Right? You're born into it if you're white. You're born into it if you're black. You're in the system, and there's no way to escape it. Now, there's only one problem with all of this. Forgive the, forgive the language. This is bullshit. Okay. There's another reason that some people fail and some people succeed in American society, and that's because some value systems are better than others. If you make better decisions, you will have more success. The truth is that white privilege isn't reality, but there are other kinds of privilege that are reality. It's what I like to call decision privilege. Decision privilege matters. So, for example, I'll give you an example. Right, for, well, before I say that, whites just to point this out, are not, they do not have a genetic predisposition to making the right decisions, and blacks do not have a genetic predisposition to making the wrong decisions. Making good decisions is inherent in, in how you act as an individual. It's your choice. It's your choice how to act. But that doesn't mean there isn't decision privilege. Decision privilege exists. So, for example, the greatest privilege in America is being born into a two-parent family. If you're born into a two-parent family, you are likely to be significantly more successful in your life than if you are born into a single-parent home. And this is true regardless of race. Right? If it were just white privilege, you would imagine that white single parents would do better than a black couple raising a child. This is untrue. The poverty rate among black couples raising children is 7%. The poverty rate among single white mothers is 22%. So what happened to white privilege? Did it just disappear? Or does it turn out it's just decision privilege, right? White privilege is not responsible for a black guy getting his black girlfriend pregnant and leaving her. That's just him being a jackass. And the same thing is true in the white community, by the way. Right? White privilege is not responsible for anybody making a bad individual decision between him and another person, or her and another person, that impacts their life. That's not because James Madison was a racist. It's not because George Washington held slaves. Right? This is because you made a bad decision where to put your penis, and now you want to run from the consequences. Here's another privilege. I call it the not committing crimes privilege. <laughs> It turns out that the higher criminality rate among any subgroup is due to more individuals in that group committing crimes. <laughs> Basic statistical fact. The idea that the, the criminal justice system is just out to get the black man is not true. It's not statistically true. The fact is that if you look at the crime reporting rates, they are almost identical to the crime arrest rates. So there's no great gap. It's not like people are reporting 60% of crimes are committed by white people, right? But 90% of the people going to prison are black. That's not how it works. Right? The racial breakdown in crime descriptions are very close, and they have been for, for at least 30 years, are very, very close to the actual arrest levels in particular communities. 
Here's the fact about that terrible, horrible, institutionally racist justice system that President Obama likes to talk about. It actually under-prosecutes murder in minority communities because there aren't enough cops and there aren't enough witnesses. And you're less likely to be arrested if you're a murderer in the black community than if you are a murderer in the white community. And so President Obama today, for example, he, said, he sicked his, his housing and urban development department on, land, uh, on landlords. He said to landlords that he's going to sue you, essentially, if you refuse to allow criminals to rent from you. Why? What's the basis of this? He says because, the, because the, the justice system is institutionally racist. And therefore, if you ban criminals from your property, what you're really doing is using code for black people. This seems kind of racist to me. Right? It seems to me that if you're banning criminals, you're banning criminals. You're not letting, banning black people, because where I come from, black people are not equivalent to criminals. And criminals are not equivalent to black people. And if that's the way President Obama wants to see it, that's his problem. How about the Black Lives Matter movement of their claims? claiming the police are disproportionately brutal and terrible to black people, and they're going around shooting people in the hands up, don't shoot scenario. They're just going around gunning down innocent young black men, and this is a tremendous threat to life and limb for young black guys. Unfortunately, the Black Lives Matter movement is based on a lie. The hands up, don't shoot situation was a lie, is a lie, and will always be a lie. And beyond that, the basic notion that the cops are going around shooting innocent black guys for no reason as a general trend across the United States is another lie. It's not true. Okay, according to Professor Peter Moskis of John Jay College, he did a study of all the folks who are being shot across the country by the cops. And what he found is that if police are in a situation where someone confronts the cops in a violent way, they are more likely to shoot a white guy than they are to shoot a black guy. And the reason for this is because there's not going to be a civil rights lawsuit if they shoot the white guy. As early as 1994, the Department of Justice found that felony cases in the country's 75 largest urban areas had lower felony prosecution rates for blacks than whites. Lower felony prosecution rates for blacks than whites. As far as sentencing, when you remove all the confounds, like prior crimes and the nature of the crime, all sentencing disparity disappears. The only, the only legal situation in which the left likes to cite institutional racism generally with regard to law is the disparity in sentencing between crack cocaine and powder cocaine, right? This is a big one, crack cocaine and powder cocaine. Only one problem. The reason there is significantly higher sentencing, or was, for crack cocaine as opposed to powder cocaine is because crack is more addictive, easier to distribute, cheaper, and the people who originally pushed for harsher sentences for people distributing crack cocaine were black Congress people from the inner city who were watching it destroy their communities. How about stop and frisk, right? Racial profiling. Well, it turns out that racial profiling actually racially under-profiles in New York. So Bill de Blasio, the communist moron from New York, he got rid of stop and frisk. He got rid of stop and frisk, and naturally the crime rates are going up in New York City. And he did it on the basis that cops were just singling out black and Hispanic people and finding them and targeting them. Only one problem. From January to June 2008, to take one six-month period, 98% of all gun assailants, all of them, all gun assailants in the city of New York were black or Hispanic, 98%. The percentage of blacks and Hispanics stopped and frisked out of 100, you know, for all races, 85%. In other words, the police were systematically discriminating against white people when it came to stop and frisk. And stop and frisk is generally for gun assailants because the idea is that you have to have reasonable suspicion in order to initiate the stop and frisk. And cops have served in NYPD know the idea is that if somebody is walking funny or they have a bump under their coat, this is generally what drives the stop and frisk in the first place. How about driving while black? There's another one that you get from the white privilege crowd, right? Driving while black. If you're driving around, you're black, then it must be because the cop, and you're pulled over by the cops, it's because the cops are horrible and terrible and they feel like pulling over a black guy that day. There's only one problem. Again, this is nonsense. In New Jersey, there was a lawsuit, a federal lawsuit, against the, the sheriff's department in the state of New Jersey because they said they were systematically discriminating against black folks when they pulled them over. So they did a study. The federal government did a study. And here's what they found. They found that 23% of all drivers stopped for speeding were black. They also found that 25% of all speeders were black. So in other words, the police were pulling over slightly less black people than the speeds would actually indicate. All of this, though, is white privilege, right? Everything is white privilege. When Baltimore, when there's a riot in Baltimore, a city that is mostly black, almost entirely black, actually, a city that is largely black, where the police force is majority black, where the police chief was black, where the mayor was black, where most of the city council was black, where all of it was Democrat, the president of the United States was black, the attorney general was black, the riot happened because of white privilege, clearly. <laughs> And if we're going to talk about privilege and the people who benefit from privilege, as long as we're just talking about people who clearly are benefiting from an institutionally racist system, let's talk about all of our Asian friends. Clearly, there's Asian privilege, right? 
Because the reality is that Princeton University found back when I was going to school, which wasn't that long ago, we used to take the SATs out of 1600. Right? Princeton University did a study. They found that black folks in the United States were receiving a bonus in terms of admissions of 230 points on the SATs. Asians were being penalized 50 points. And they should be penalized 50 points, right? Because of all of our Asian founders who created an Asian system benefiting all of the Asian folks. <laughs> Forget all the Asian folks who were being forced to work on the railroads for nothing and dying in, in your slave labor. Right? Oh, that, that, was, that was an aberration. It was really the fact that the Constitution was written in Chinese that is the, that is the key fact. So it turns out that there is no such thing as white privilege. There is just a decision privilege. This does not mean there are not individual racists. There are. It doesn't mean that there can't be laws that are racist. There can be, and we can fight those. But what we can't fight is ghosts. Right? We're not ghostbusters. Right? That's not what we do. And, by the way, the movement's terrible, but, but aside from that... <laughs> We're not Ghostbusters because when people say vague things like white privilege or institutional racism, it is utterly unhelpful, and not only that, it's counterproductive. Because the idea that the left is putting forward is they put forward a problem, right? There are more blacks in prison than are proportionate to the population. And then instead of saying, okay, let's look at why that is, they say white privilege is responsible for that. Our recommendation is that we now use the Department of Justice to rewrite all the rules for all the police departments. And if you say, well, that sounds like a bad solution, considering that black communities more than anybody else need more cops in their communities to make sure that people are safe, then they say, whoa, 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 but we already said it's white institutional privilege, it's white racism, it's white privilege, right? And therefore, if you oppose my measure, it must be because you're a racist. So white privilege is used as a club to silence anybody who disagrees with the particular policies of the left. In the end, white privilege should, go, should be put to the side in favor of an individual standard to which we're all held, be a decent human being. So what happens when we actually get down to the root of it? When, what happens when we get down to the idea that individuals should be decent human beings, but the left is still not fulfilled because there's still no fairness of outcome, right? Because as I mentioned, if people are held responsible for their individual decisions, some people will succeed and some people will fail. Some people will swim and some people will sink. Well, then the left has to figure out another metric of success, another metric of fairness that they can institute. And this is the equality of feelings. And we all have to feel special on our insides, just like Barney told us when we were little. We all have to feel protected, and we all have to feel special, and we all have to feel as though our feelings are being taken care of. We all have to be embraced in that warm cocoon of love by everyone who surrounds us. And this is why we have trigger warnings, right? We have to have trigger warnings because we wouldn't want anyone to feel uncomfortable. Even though most of life and learning in life is about feeling uncomfortable, we have to make sure that everyone feels comfortable. And so we have trigger warnings. And these trigger warnings involve anything that could possibly offend you, I'm going to warn you about in advance, and then you can leave or avoid it. You can avoid all problems in your life until the point at which you actually have to get a job and then you're totally screwed. So, for example, Harvard Crimson last week, this is a piece in the Harvard Crimson, the student wrote, in a class I attended earlier this semester, a large portion of the first meeting was devoted to compiling a list of rules for class discussion. A student contended that as a woman, she would be unable to sit across from a student who declared that he was strongly against abortion, and the other students in the seminar vigorously defended this declaration, the professor remained silent. So the trigger warning was used to silence someone with opposing point of view based on identity politics. That's what trigger warning is designed to do, because we must all be protected. Unless, of course, again, you're one of these evil, terrible, white, heterosexual, Christian, cisgender males. If you're one of those, then we don't protect your feelings. But if you're anybody else, we have to protect your feelings by issuing trigger warnings, which is super pathetic. And, if you're, and, and just a note to all the people who feel they need regular trigger warnings, your snowflake little rainbow life is not going to continue as soon as you leave this campus. No one's going to sign you a check for your feelings. Right? It turns out that you're not being paid to pursue the power of your dreams. So, here's the problem. Once you get past the trigger warnings, right, once you get past the trigger warnings, and let's say the trigger warning wasn't issued, then you enter into the really dangerous world, and that is the world of microaggressions. So this, to me, is the most dangerous part of what's happening on today's campus, is the language of microaggressions being pushed by the left. The, the, the word itself suggests the problem. It's not just you're saying something that offends me, it's that you are aggressing me. In the real world, when someone aggresses you, when someone is aggressive to you, you are aggressive in response. Right? If somebody microaggresses you, the answer is to be aggressive in response. And this has bled over, unfortunately, into the entire American left. This idea, and it's really ugly, and it's, it's even bleeding over, I think, into, into some elements of the right. It's very ugly, this idea that if I'm offended, I get to take physical action against you, which is where microaggressions go. Right? You're aggressing me. And it's not just that we have to forbid your activity, it's that you deserve something bad happening to you. There must be some sort of ramifications to you offending me. And I, lived in, I grew up in a country where 
offending people was just part of being American, right? And being offended was part of being an American. It's called free speech. But microaggressions suggest the opposite. Microaggressions are a fascist way of thinking. The idea, again, is if I say something you don't like, then you get to be aggressive with me. So I'll give a, a so you, you, you know all the examples, right? If you use he and she instead of z, which isn't even a word, right? If you, if you say things to people like, where are you from? This is a microaggression now. If you say things that are factual, this could be a microaggression. All these things could be microaggression. My favorite example comes, uh, and I'll just tell the story because it's fun. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, have seen, for, for those of you who have seen any of my appearances on TV, one of the ones that has the most kind of hits uh, is, is one from CNN Headline News about, on Dr. Drew's show, it was about seven months ago. And, uh, and I was on Dr. Drew's show to discuss Caitlyn Jenner. And this is right after Caitlyn Jenner had, had decided that he was a woman, and the entire world was deciding whether or not Caitlyn Jenner ought to receive sainthood. And, and, and they, were, they were digging around, if you recall, to, to see if they could find a few miracles that they could attribute to Caitlyn Jenner so they could be eligible and we could go to the Pope and the Pope would actually appoint Caitlyn Jenner a saint while he was still alive. This was one of the big questions that was surrounding Caitlyn Jenner. And ESPN decided that ESPN was going to give Caitlyn Jenner the Heroism Award because having a couple of surgeries, some hormone injections, and going on TV wearing very expensive designer gowns is the new Normandy. So, so I was, uh, I was asked to talk about this on, uh, on Dr. Drew's show because I'm the only conservative in Los Angeles. And, <laughs> and as you can tell, my view on transgenderism is that the height of cruelty is society pretending along with delusion because what you are doing is you're harming people who are mentally ill. Uh, this, is, this is my informed genetic view of science. And it turns out that men can't magically become women and women can't magically become men. That's a bunch of cruelty. So this was my view, and they knew this was my view. So they decided to have me on the show, and the producer comes up to me before the show, and he says, well, we don't really have good ratings on this show. And I said, yes, I'm aware. And, <laughs> and, and, the, producer said, and the producer says, we want to get the ratings up, and this is why we, we have you on. What are you going to say? I said, here's what I'm going to say. And, he, and at this point, I should have known something was, was going to go badly because the, the producer mentioned that he was a producer for Jerry Springer before. And, uh, and so, the, and so he, uh, we go in, and I have my view. That's fine. We sit down, and it's me and I think six other people on the panel, which makes it almost fair for them. And <laughs> they're all against me, obviously. And, and, so, and they sit me right next to a fellow whose name is Zoe Turr, who's formerly Bob Turr, male to female, transgender. And we're having this conversation, right? Should Caitlyn Jenner be given the Medal of Honor or should Caitlyn Jenner be given a full burial in Arlington National Cemetery at some point, right? I mean, the, the, and it's just a question of, is the heroism greater, greater than or less than SEAL Team 6, right? This is, this, is really, this is literally how the conversation is going. And finally they come to me and I say what I just said to you, right? I said, I don't understand why as a society it's beneficial for us to engage in the delusions of the mentally ill. It's damaging to the mentally ill, it's damaging to society's standards of male and female, and it's counterproductive. So I say this, and naturally this is an unpopular view, uh, and, and the guy sitting next to me, uh, who thinks he's a woman, he, uh, he, he, he turns to me and he says, you don't know anything about science. And I said, well, I know genetics, and I know that Caitlyn Jenner has a Y chromosome in every cell of his body, ironically, except for some of his sperm cells. Right? Like, this is, like, I, I understand that much. And the guy says, well, you don't know anything about genetics. And I said to, and I said to him, well, what are your genetics, sir? And it was the sir that sent him off. And, and, and right now the guy, seriously, it did not even occur to me not to call him sir.